So this lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about limits and exactness of modules. Um, so the basic problem we want to discuss is suppose we're given exact sequences of modules over a ring where the elements i are in some category j, and we want to ask whether the limit of the a i, um, so the limit of these sequences is exact. So is this exact? Um, so last lecture, we discussed the same problem for co-limits. Um, and much of the discussion of limits is very similar to the discussion of co-limits. Um, so I'll first summarize the things that are similar to the um, discussion for co-limits. First of all, the limb functor is left exact. This means that um, at least this part of the sequence is automatically exact, and it's only the question of whether this limit maps onto this limit that we need to discuss. So the proof of this is the same as the proof that the co-limit functor is right exact, except that you change the direction of all arrows. And I gave two proofs of that last time, and I'm not going to go through them again. Um, in particular, um, Lim has a derived functor um, usually denoted by Lim1 um, and the um, if Lim1 of the AI is zero then the limit of the BI maps onto the limit of the CI. So the question we really want to ask is when is this derived function of the inverse limit zero on, on, the, on the sequence AI? Um, incidentally, um, in case you're wondering, you can also get higher derived functors of the, of the limit for various abelian categories. They can be really weird. Um, you start getting running into set theoretic problems when you try calculating them and as far as I know, they're not used very much in ordinary commutative algebra, so I won't say much more about them. Um, now, we also saw that for co-limits, um, need not be um, left exact. And we gave some examples of this. Similarly, limit need not be right exact. And let's start by having an example of this. Um, a simple example is to take the sequence naught goes to z, goes to z, goes to z over 2z, which you may recognize as being the standard counterexample to absolutely everything. So this is an exact sequence, and we're going to take another copy of it. And then we're going to take another copy of this um, up there, and we're going to just keep going. So we're taking an infinite number of copies of this sequence. And now let's work out what the co-limits of this are. So the co-limit, uh, I guess I forgot to say, these maps here are going to be multiplication by three. So the co-limit of this means you need to take an element of each of these um, copies of the integers, such that this map to this map is multiplication by three. So this element needs to be three times something, but it also needs to be nine times something because it's in the image of something here and so on. So um, it has to be a three to the n times something for every n, which is only possible if it's zero. So we get naught goes to zero and we get zero again for the same reason. But here, multiplication by three is an isomorphism. So we get z modulo two z goes to zero and it's certainly not exact here. Um, so, um, slightly worrying thing about this is that um, this is a this is a limit over um, well, it's sort of filtered except it's the arrows are going in the wrong direction. So I guess you might call this co-filtered. 
if I can invent a term. So this is a limit over a co-filtered sequence of exact sequences, and the result isn't exact. So a co-limit over a filtered um, collection is exact, as we showed last time. However, the analog for limits isn't true, that, that um, limits over co-filtered need not be exact. So the problem is that we want to find um, some condition that makes limits exact. Um, and um, just before doing this, let's just give an example of why you might want limits to be exact. So um, we will short, soon be discussing the completion of a module um, M with respect to an ideal here is just the limit of um, the maps um, M um, over I and um, this is mapped to by M over I squared, which is mapped to by M over I cubed and so on. So, so um, a particular special case of a limit is a completion and we want to know is if naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to naught, is the completion naught goes to A hat, so I should say the completion is M hat, goes to B hat, goes to C hat, goes to naught exact. And the answer is it's exact except possibly here, the map from the completion of B to the completion of C may not be surjective, and we want to find conditions under which it is surjective. So we want to know when does the limit preserve exactness? In other words, well, this is exact if um, the first derived functor of the limit applied to A, uh, applied to the A's is zero. Um, well, the answer is, I guess I should say it's answer, not A. Um, this vanishes if A, the number A, I satisfy the mittag leffler condition. So who was Mittag Leffler and what was his condition? Well, um, Mittag Leffler um, was, uh, first better point out that it was just sort of one name, except that Leffler was his father's name and Mittag was his mother's name and he kind of joined them together for um, some reason I don't know. So what was the Mittag Leffler condition? Well, Mittag Leffler was working well before anybody messed around with derived sequences or limits and um, he was actually working in complex analysis. So it's uh, um, the, the way his name got attached to this condition is rather roundabout. It seems to have originated with um, Bourbaki's book on general topology. And if you look at one of his theorems here, let me just try and um, focus in on it a bit so it becomes legible. So here we have a theorem credited to Mittag Leffler, and you see he's got an inverse system of Hausdorff uniform spaces, and um, there's this funny condition here, marked ML, and if you look at it, you'll see that this is actually rather um, similar to the condition we're going to write a bit later. Well, it's pretty certain that Mittag Leffler didn't actually write down this theorem in any of his published papers, because Uniform spaces were only invented quite a long time after he died, but um, he had some argument in one of his papers about complex analysis, which is sort of vaguely similar to the proof of this theorem. So um, the connection with mittag leffler is, is rather indirect. Anyway, it's, it's now called the mittag leffler condition. So, um, so what is the mittag leffler condition? Well, you can state a mittag leffler condition for arbitrary um, filtered or co-filtered sets, but we're just going to do the mittag leffler condition um, for um, taking a limit over um, this category where you've just got elements one, two, three, 
four and so on. Um, this is by far the most important case. It's what you need to take a limit over to construct completions. Um, uh, sorry, I forgot to um, reduce the magnification so, so that you can see it. So we're just going to do the Mittag-Leffler condition for this case. Um, and the Mittag-Leffler condition is as follows. It says that naught goes to the limit of the AI goes to limit BI goes to limit CI goes to naught is exact if A satisfies the following condition. The image of AJ in AI stabilizes for um, J large. So what's going on here is, is we've got the space AI, and this contains the image of AI plus one, sorry, um, contains, which contains the image of AI plus two and so on. And what we want is that um, these maps, these inclusions here are eventually all equal. So we have the image of a n plus i equals the image of a n plus i plus one equals the image of a n plus i plus two and so on for some n depending on i. Um, so um, an example of this or an example that doesn't satisfy this is if we take the um, A0 to be Z and A1 to be Z and A2 to be Z and so on, and we take all these to be multiplication by three, then you can see the image of this doesn't stabilize because the image of this in A0 is 3Z and the image of this is 9Z and the image of this is 27Z and so on. So this is the example this appears in the example we had earlier where limits are not exact and you can see it doesn't satisfy mittag leffler's condition. Um, well, proving that if mittag leffler's condition holds, then um, the limits are exact is a bit tricky to do directly. What we're going to do it is do it in three stages. So, so let's do first of all do case one. Case one is when AI plus one goes to a i is on to for all i. So if this condition is satisfied, then the mittag leffler condition is trivially satisfied because the image of any a j in a i is just a i. So let's look at what's happening. We've got naught goes to a i plus one goes to b i plus one goes to c i plus one goes to zero. And we've got naught goes to a i goes to b i goes to ci goes to zero. And we're trying to show that the limit of the bi maps onto the limit of the ci. Well, um, what we have is we've got an element ci plus one and an element ci and various other elements for all the other subscripts. Um, so if we pick an element in the inverse limit of the ci in particular, we've got two elements like that. And suppose we found an element bi mapping onto ci. What we want to do is to lift it to an element bi plus one here. So let's put a question mark because we don't know whether that exists yet, which maps to bi and also maps to ci plus one. And if we do that, we can just sort of keep going. Well, um, so, um, so since this map is onto, we can pick an element X. Um, let me find it. So we can pick an element X mapping onto CI plus one. The problem is it, it will map onto some element Y, which might not be equal to BI. However, since this map is injective, there's an element in AI um, mapping to bi minus y, so, so let's call this element z, so z maps to bi minus y. 
And this map here is onto, so we can lift Z to an element W, mapping onto Z. And we can then take our element BI plus one to be um, X minus, um, sorry, minus X plus the image of W, because that will then um, make this element equal to um, the element bi. So using the fact that this map is onto, we can um, repeatedly lift bi to an element bi plus one. And by doing that an infinite number of times and muttering something about the axiom of choice, we can show that um, the limit of the bi that to the limit of the, c, the limit of the ci is on two. So that does one case of the mittag leffler um, result. Let's do case two, which is a sort of opposite result. Here, we're going to do the case when ai plus j mapping to ai is zero for i large, for, sorry, for j large. So this is the almost the opposite of these maps being onto. We're saying that these maps are eventually zero. Well, we can assume that ai plus one mapping onto ai is onto um, and to do this, we just replace a0, a1, a2, and so on by some subsequence. So we can pick a0 and then pick a, a, a different a1 to be the, the first element such that the map to a0 is zero, is zero and so on. So we can assume this condition here. Um, and now we need to... Um, we need to use a different argument to show that the limit of the bi mapping to the limit of the ci is on to. So here, as before, we've got these elements. Um, we've got this exact sequence. And we suppose that we are given elements ci and ci plus one. And we've got an element ci plus one mapping to ci. And previously, we started with an element in bi and tried to lift it to bi plus one. We can't actually do that here. Um, what we do is we first lift ci plus one to some element x in bi plus one. And then we take the image of x here. And we're going to call this image bi. And you can see that bi then maps onto ci. Well, the problem is, um, is this bi unique? And the key point is that it is. So, so let's just point out that bi is unique and does not depend on the choice of x. And the reason for this is, suppose we've got another element x prime here. Well, then um, x minus x prime is the image of some element y here. So y goes to x minus x prime. And the image of y here will be, um, so if x prime maps to bi prime, then the image of y here will be bi minus bi prime. However, this map here is just the zero map. So bi is equal to bi prime. So what this means is that this choice of bi doesn't depend on the choice of lifting here. And now um, we choose bi for all i like this. And then it's easy to check that bi is the image of bi plus one. Notice that bi plus one depends on um, the space bi plus two up here and so on. And since the element bi maps to ci, that means we've constructed a canonical element mapping to the inverse limit of all these ci's. So in this case, um, the map from the limit of the bi to the limit of the ci is also on two. Now we need to do the third case, 
which is the general case. And to do this, we need to sort of combine the arguments for case one and case two. Um, fortunately, this is quite easy to do. So um, what we've got is we've got an exact sequence, um, something or other, A3 goes to A2, goes to A1, goes to A0. And we assume that this satisfies the mitzag leffler condition. And then we, 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 we put AI prime is the stable limit of um, AI plus J. You remember the image of AI plus J eventually stabilizes. So we now have these maps. A3 prime goes to A2 prime goes to A1 prime goes to A0 prime. And notice these maps are all on two because AI prime is the stable limit and you can easily check that maps between the stable limits are on two. Um, so we have an exact sequence, naught goes to AI prime goes to AI goes to AI over AI prime. And um, these maps here satisfy the condition that AI plus one prime goes to AI prime is on two. So it satisfies case one that we covered earlier. Um, on the other hand, um, you can check that these things here satisfy case two. So the mitzag leffler condition applies to um, both these um, modules and to these modules. So we find that the derived functor of the limit applied to the AI prime is equal to zero, and the derived first derived functor of the limit applied to AI over AI prime is also equal to zero. But now you remember from homological algebra that we have an exact sequence going from limb one of AI prime goes to limb one of AI goes to limb one of AI over AI prime. So if, if this is zero and this is zero, it follows that this is also equal to zero, which is what we wanted to prove. This, this means that any exact sequence um, with the AIs on the left, then if you take the limits, um, the, 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 it, it's, it remains exact. So this proves the mittag leffler condition that um, if the AI satisfy the mittag leffler condition, then the limit of the BI mapping to the limit CI is on two. Um, we can have one um, example of this, um, suppose we have maps naught goes to AI goes to BI goes to CI goes to naught with all the AI finite. Um, by this, I don't mean they're finitely generated or anything like that. I mean, they're finite as sets. Then the limit of the BI mapping to the limit of the CI is on two. And the reason for this is that if all the AI are finite, this implies any decreasing sequence of modules stabilizes. So for, a bit, so for abelian groups, provided the kernels of all these maps are finite, um, the, 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 the limit of the BI maps onto the limit of the CI. Um, again, you remember we had an example earlier where the AIs were all, were all Z. So if the AIs are infinite, this, um, the limit of the BIs doesn't necessarily map onto the limit of the CIs. Um, of course, um, this doesn't need to be finite. Um, you can see all we need is that the decreasing sequence of submodules has to stabilize. So this also applies to for Artinian modules. Okay, um, next lecture we will be, we'll be moving on to study completions and 
during our study of completions, we will need this result about when a limit um, of modules maps onto a limit of modules.